right time. And what we're going to call this series is Journey of the Soul. So we are all on a journey. Our soul is on a journey. We as a people are on a journey. Moses is this story of a man on a journey from the beginning to the end. This guy is just his name could be Quest, you know, because he's on a journey the whole time. So we left off in, um, in before his story, we, we come to the end of Genesis, where the 12 sons of Israel, uh, they lived in Egypt for 400 years. Joseph, if you remember, you can go back and read it later if you want to. It's at the end of Genesis. Joseph uh, saves his whole family, basically, and his 12 brothers and mother and father. And they come, they move to Egypt to live there where they're safe. And 400 years go by, and these 12 sons turn into 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. Then it says that a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph enters the scene. And he starts wondering why all these people are freeloading. He starts wondering, what's going on here? These people, they're they're multiplying. They're multiplying. They're they're outnumbering the Egyptians now. What would stop them from teaming up with our enemies and taking us over? And so this Pharaoh is a little bit... uh, um, uh, just paranoid, and he's, he's wondering what, you know, if, if what he needs to do. He's afraid of losing power because the Hebrew slaves are getting, or the Hebrews are getting stronger and stronger. So he makes them slaves. And anybody here watch Prince of Egypt? Okay. All right. So they start making these bricks and stuff like that, and, and he makes them a slave, makes the whole nation a slave. And he's still afraid of losing power, and they're reproducing so fast that Pharaoh says, Let's go and kill all the babies. All the male babies, not the females, but the male babies. Let's keep them from procreating anymore. Well, this is where Moses enters the scene. Moses enters the scene in, in, in Exodus chapter 2-ish. And, um, and his mother, knowing that they're going to come and kill her son, puts him in a basket saying, well, he's better off in the river. Maybe somehow God will do something. She puts him in a basket, puts him in the river, and the river takes him down the Nile. Now his sister, his older sister, Miriam, is following along, you know, seeing what's going to happen to her baby brother. Just can't believe, can't, oh my God, is there going to be an alligator? Is there going to, what's going to happen to, the, to my brother? And she's running along, uh, but probably without her mom's knowing about it. And she runs along and she sees the, the basket and it starts veering towards the palace. Now the palace is where the Pharaoh's daughter was taking a bath. And this, this basket comes up into the reeds and they come and they get this basket and they see this baby. And oh, so cute, baby. And so she's like, dad, can I keep him? He's like, sure, fine you can keep the baby uh, but Miriam his sister comes out of the out of the reeds and was like hey I know of a lady who could breastfeed him and wean him and she's like sure so Miriam takes her brother back to her mom which is a cool sign you know the mom gets to then breastfeed and and then and then raise Moses up till he's about two or three years old where then she has to give back Moses her baby back to Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter then raises him as her own son. And there Moses grows up, the prince of Egypt. But he's not really Egyptian, and he's not really Hebrew. I mean, he is Hebrew, but he's completely estranged from his people. So he grew up, you know, Egyptian, and then he, one day he realizes, we don't know where, we re- he, but he realized that he's not really Egyptian, that he's actually the people that his grandfather or dad or however that works is, is making slaves for his country. We don't see that because next scene, the scene changes, boom, now Moses is all grown up and he's actually about 40 by this time, next time we see him. And if we turn to chapter two, verse 11 of the Exodus there, it says, now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, I guess 40 is grown. I'm not quite there yet. I'm not quite grown up yet, obviously. Still act like a kid too much. That he went out to his brethren, meaning the Hebrew slaves. So at some point, he starts to identify a little bit more with his brethren than with his own uh, father, or I guess grandfather, because Pharaoh's daughter, that would make Pharaoh his grandfather-ish, something. He goes out to his brethren, and he looked at their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own brethren. Now, he already knows that he's not Egyptian, but somewhere along the way, he begins to to be this man stuck between two worlds. This is a man with an identity crisis. This is a man uh, that's born a Hebrew, but raised as a pagan uh, under the sun god, Ra, to believe that his mother's father, the Pharaoh, was a god. 
was a deity. See, back then they believed that, uh, that, that uh, pharaohs were gods, were deity, but not, and, and that, that his brother or uncle or whatever you would say Ramses is, it would be his, I guess his mom's brother, but it's really his age, Ramses, we'll call him his brother, is also a god as well because the son of Pharaoh is in the lineage of heaven. So, so here we have his brothers, but not Moses. He's kind of a part of this life, but, but deep down he knows he's different. He doesn't really fit in. So I'm sure that when he was a boy, his grandfather, you know, Pharaoh, would be sitting around the table and be like, oh, son, you are a god, and you will raise up, and you shall rule this mighty place, and you will do these things, and you will build pyramids, and it will be amazing. And, and, and Ramses was like, yes, yes, this is awesome. And then Moses probably piped up and was like, hey, cool, Grandpa, what, what about me? And then Grandpa's eyes furrow and look at him like, what did thou say? <laughs> and I'm sure that Pharaoh's daughter, Moses' mother, we're just, anyway, said, shh, Moses, not now, shh, well, I'll, I'll tell you later. It's not really like that. He's like, oh, what's different about me? I don't really understand. I'll tell you later, just shh. And I can imagine somewhere as he's growing up, sometimes Moses and Ramses will be up on the, on the temple uh, or the palace roof, you know, looking up at the stars and talking about their futures. And, and Ramses will be like, man, one day when I'm going to be Pharaoh and, and I'm going to be doing this and I'm going to be doing that. And Moses will be like, yeah. And when I'm, I, oh, yeah, um, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I'll be right there with you, man. I'll be your master builder or something maybe. You can be Leonardo. I'll be Donatello, you know. Fine. That's cool. Whatevs. And at some point, he finds out that he's kind of like a household pet with a lot of privilege. It's actually more than most people, even Egyptians, because he lives in the palace. But there's something different about him. And either one, he feels guilty for being treated so well when his people are out there making bricks and being beaten. Or maybe, maybe number two, maybe he pretends... That, that maybe he just kind of closed, I'm not really a Hebrew, I'm an Egyptian, and I'm, uh, b- b- but he can't, maybe, 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 maybe that's what happened. Or, or maybe three, maybe he gets angry at the treatment of his people. In any case, he's curious about where he comes from. And, and so verse 11 says he goes out to his people, and, and maybe he whispers to one of them, and he's like, hey, man, hey, psh, man, I can, I can pull some strings. I, I know some people, like, I can help you. Like, I think I could. I could, I could help you out, man. I, I, you know, I got, some, I got some swag, you know? I got connections. And, and, and I, I can imagine them sneering and say, Psh, you're not one of us, rich boy. But Moses, he just wants to belong. You know, he just wants to be, he, 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 but he doesn't belong in either place. And, and, and he's a man in, in a soul crisis. He can either live a lie or he can face the hardest truth he's ever faced and lose everything that he grew up. I mean, everything he'd known from three up to 40, he could lose all of that to join with that. But something inside of him is compelling him, saying something's not right. So I can't keep living a lie. And he's sitting there and he sees one of his own people being beaten and he tries to suppress the thought, no, 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 just, just chill, just don't do anything. He, he tries to look the other way, tries to pretend he doesn't see it, tries to think that about his own, oh, my Egyptian mother and, and my brother Ramses and oh yeah, good things, back at the palace, happy thoughts, it was great, we were riding our chariots earlier today, it was awesome, it was so much fun. And he's trying to think of the meat pots, oh, the meat pots of Egypt, oh man, there's so much meat and there's fish and man, there's food, we can eat all the food, but he he sees it, whoosh, whoosh, keeping on going, and there's something that begins to boil over inside of his soul, something that can't let him sit still anymore. Something says, I've got to do something about this, and, and, and like this injustice, it's like this, this glaring red beak and just beep, beep, going off in his mind, and it's all that he can see, and it says in chapter 2, verse 12, he looked this way, and he looked that way, and when he saw no one, he just goes up and whacks that Egyptian and kills him. And hides him in the sand. Whoa, okay. I mean, that's one way to deal with your problems. Just something goes wrong and just bam, you're dead. You ever been anybody, around anybody like that? Yeah. It's, like, it's like you say one thing. It's like, ah! And you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Good God, man. Anybody? Come on. Raise your hand if you know somebody like that. It's like, holy cow. Now, I... I want you to think about this for a minute. I mean, couldn't Moses have said, I mean, he's the prince of Egypt, right? Couldn't he have said, hey, you, quit that. Quit that crap. 
And the Egyptians were like, okay. No, he just goes, whack, and he's dead. All right. And then he hides him. Someone say, he hit him in the sand. Well, that escalated rather quickly. Can I just say that nothing comes from nothing? Nothing comes from nothing. What does that mean, nothing comes from nothing? It means that every reaction comes from an action, something that our good friend Sir Isaac Newton would find out thousands of years later was that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. In essence, nothing comes from nothing. Everything comes from something, from somewhere. So though we might look at that and think, wow, that's a pretty drastic thing, there was an equal and opposite reaction to something that was an action before that, and perhaps it was that 40 years of growing up and suppressing things, come on, suppressing emotions, suppressing this idea of being different and not knowing how to deal with it, suppressing, you know, concealing and not feeling, and just ask Elsa how that turned out for her. See, Moses had to develop these coping mechanisms along the way. Think about it. He was born into a world where everyone his age and his race was killed because they were the wrong color. Everyone his age and his race was dead because his grandpa killed them all. Go, go figure how that, how are you going to deal with that one? He was abandoned by his mom, even by necessity, given back to her, then stripped away from her again, raised in a pagan environment, not allowed to hang out with the riffraff who ended up being his own people. What does mom think about me? What does grandpa think of me? Am I really like a dog? Am I a pet? What am I? An identity crisis. Now, he has always had something to prove, and, and he has to repress a lot of anger. How do we know that? Because in Moses' life, if you read through all of, you know, Genesis, or Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you see a few times where his go-to expression is anger. He outbursts of wrath. Wham! He strikes things and gets angry and stuff like that. Now, granted, it's usually due, I mean, most of us would be striking a whole lot more, so he was really self-controlled, but his go-to boiling expression was anger. We see outbursts of this all the time. Think about it. When normal brothers fight, dad comes in and says, hey, you two, get over, bend over, whoops, whoops. both of you get a spanking. But not in this family. No, not in this family because Ramses was a god. So anytime anything happened, it was Moses' fault. Think about it. I mean, just put two and two together. Ramses could not do any wrong. He was a deity. Moses, it had to have been your fault. Talk about a golden child. So Moses never can show his anger. So what does he do with it? He bottles it up, and he represses it, suppresses it, keeps it inside, does not let it out, and still don't feel well, after a lifetime of holding in and suppressing and pushing it down, at age 40, it finally boils over. Some say boils over. It finally gets to be too much, and he kills a man. And even pagans know that killing a man is wrong, so even for a prince, he can't even kill somebody without, and get away with it. So, so he tries to bury his sin and forget that it ever happened. Move on. No one has to know. We'll just pretend like it didn't happen. No one saw it. I looked this way. I looked that way. No one saw it. I'll take his body. I'll hide it in the sand. No one has to know I did justice. It was all good. I, I figured it out. I'll bury my sin and get rid of it. Verse 13. And when he went out the second day, behold, now, you know, he thinks he did something right. So he's walking out like, hey, I'm the deliverer, which he ends up being, by the way. But not that way. Not his own way. Not in his own hands. He has to do it God's way. So he goes out, and behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to one of them who did wrong, hey, why are you striking your companion? And he said, what, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me like you killed that Egyptian the other day? And Moses probably thought that he was, his people were going to think he was a hero. He was walking in like, hey, do you see what I did back there? I killed that David. Yeah, I'm one of you now, right? They're like, you're not one of us, rich boy. So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. Oh, no, my sin has been revealed. Uh-oh. And what do we do when we sin? <laughs> we usually try to hide it, right? We either downplay it 
oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, it's kind of a big deal, but, you know, I did this. Or two, we continue downplaying it by projecting on something. Well, you know, someone else did this to me, and therefore it was an equal and opposite reaction, right? And three, don't tell all the facts, et cetera. Don't, 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 you know, there are some pretty incriminating facts that I can just leave out, and perhaps if I do that, then I'll still look like the good guy while still kind of telling the truth. Greatest lies is the 90% truth, right? So we are more afraid, come on now, we are more afraid of being caught than we are at the damage that the sin does to our own soul. Because we're more afraid of man than we are of God, or we're more afraid of man than we are of sin. We're more afraid of what other people or what, what man can do to you than what your sin is already doing to you. You don't understand that when we sin, it's not a natural thing for believers to do, although we've been told, no, you can't go a day without sinning. I understand, blah, blah, blah. But it's basically like putting a poison drip into your arm and, 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 and you don't realize it, but every time you push that button, that you put that poison into your body, every time you put that poison into your soul, you are killing yourself. You don't even realize it. That it is hurting you so bad. that you don't, We're more afraid of being caught, though, with that button than we are with this. We're more afraid of that than what the sin is doing to us, to your soul, killing your soul. These things, over time, they begin to just boil over. Anger, lust, outbursts of wrath, whatever it may be. And, and somebody walks across this invisible trip line, tink, and then boom, you blow up. You know what I'm saying? This outburst is boiling over, and you're even thinking, what happened? How did that happen? I, I wasn't planning on doing that. Why did that little thing set me off in such a huge reaction? You know what I'm talking about? Does anybody know what I'm saying? And something begins to boil over. So the title of my sermon tonight is Boiling Over. An equal and opposite reaction pours out on those around you, whatever Egyptian happens to be standing by. And at 40, finally, Moses begins to boil over with all this pus and poison that he's been storing up his whole life. It finally starts coming out on other people. And when someone has a strong reaction, I want you to hear me. When someone has a strong reaction, say an allergic reaction or whatever, it is in direct relation to the, uh, the trigger that was pulled, right? It's not because they're making a big deal out of nothing. I want you to hear me. It's not because they're babies. It's not because they're just making a big deal out of nothing. It's because in their mind, it is an equal and opposite reaction. That it makes for an equal reaction to what happened to them. Maybe it wasn't what just happened, but the wounds of their past. Maybe they had 15 things stacking up on them that day, and you happen to be the last one to trip that wire, and then, <laughs> see, you never know where somebody's coming from. You, you know, when someone cuts you off in traffic, when somebody does something crazy, when, when somebody just jumps up all over you, or maybe you work at a retail store and somebody's yelling at you, you know, that doesn't just come from nowhere. There's something that happened that caused that. And it might not have been that exact thing. It could have been a wound from the past. Or it could be the voice of the accuser that's constantly berating their mind, telling them how much of a loser they are and how much of a failure they are, how much of a horrible father they are, how much of a horrible son they are, how much, of, how much they never, no one likes them, and blah, 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 blah. Anybody know that voice? The Bible says that the accuser stands before the throne of God accusing you day and night. And he stands in your ear playing a tape recorder of all the things that you've done wrong, all the things that you've messed up with, everything that's, that, that you are not good at or whatever, and just blasts you with it. You look at yourself in the mirror and you curse yourself. You, every day, this accuser is on your shoulder. Good thing is, the Bible says that, that, the, uh, the, that we have a mediator who stands before the throne of God also fighting on our behalf as well. But who are we going to listen to? That, that accuser is yipping at them, constantly whispering loathing, self-hatred at them. Or maybe it's a memory that they have forgotten, but the wound is still tender. Still tender. I used to play football for the Perryton Rangers. <laughs> Do we got any Perryton, Perryton Rangers in here? One, we got a Perryton Ranger in here. Awesome, very good. <laughs> Boom. We used, I used to play for the Perryton Rangers, and one day we were playing against Dalhart, the dreaded Dalhart. And we were playing in the rain, and it was so awesome. I was a fullback, and, 
And I was running through the line, and somehow one of the Dow Hart guys got around behind, and he speared me right in the back. It was in the rain. It was crazy. It cut me open. I'm bleeding, but I keep playing, and it's cool. And I get back to the locker room, and I'm taking off my pads, you know, and I'm like, man, I am stiff. I don't know what's going on. And the coach looks over, look tall. That's what I'm talking about. And everyone's like cheering and everything. I'm like, what are you talking about? Look at his back. And I'm like bleeding all over the place. He's like, that boy just keeps playing. That's how you play football. I tell you, play. And you don't let him get your knees. You don't let him get your knees, little. If you learn nothing else, don't let him get your knees. And so, you know, that's all cool and everything. And I'm, you know, and, and the, but the next day, like, I literally can't walk. I can't move. I'm like, oh, man, I can't move my legs. I'm like, oh, crap, I'm going paralyzed. What's going on? And my mom's like, let's just take you to the chiropractor. So we go to the chiropractor. I hadn't heard about the great, amazing cool things of chiropractors at that point. And so I go to the chiropractor, and he's like kind of feeling around on my back, and he says, he, and he touches just this muscle on the side, you know, in the back right here. And he's like, is that tender? And I'm like, whoa! And I mean, I just had this reaction. I just about jumped off the table. I'm like, wow! I mean, he barely touched my back, and I just well came off the table. He's like, yeah, something's way out of whack here. When things... When things are out of whack, it doesn't take a big touch, even a gentle touch, to make you come up off the table. Is there something tender to the touch in your life? A couple of weeks ago, Carrie bought this refrigerator off this buy, seller, trade thing. Oh my gosh, that little buy, seller, trade thing is about to kill me. Anyway, um, she bought this refrigerator on Facebook and... Uh, and, and, we're, and she's like, hey, when you go pick it up, I'm like, no, yeah, we'll pick it, all right, we got to go, all right, let's go pick it, all right, let's go pick it up, fine, I got to get people, all right, all right, Cooper Turok, uh, my little brother Jimmy, all right, come on, let's go, let's get in the pickup, let's go pick up this refrigerator, oh, it's on the north side of Amarillo, so I mean, it's all the way out by Tyson's packing plant, okay, fine, let's, all right, I'm sure these guys have nothing going on in their lives, so we get in the pickup, and, and we're going, and, um, and, 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 and she's asking me all these questions, and finally I just start getting snippy with her. I'm just, I'm like just griping at her, like, like meh, 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 you know? I start to boil over, and, and, and right in front of Turok and Cooper, my little brother Jimmy, and, and, and later on that night, I mean, she just gets quiet, and later on that night she's like, what is going on with you? Like, did you get another Facebook fight or something? <laughs> did somebody else jump on your back for saying the sky is blue? I mean, come on. That's my, call, my, my claim to fame is I can say anything and people will jump on me, you know. <laughs> delete, delete, delete. <laughs> I've had to even get rid of some friends just because I've got to let them quit beating on me. Like, hey, my friends don't beat up on me like that. Anyway, um, she, was like, she was like, did you get another Facebook fight? I'm like, no. And I'm like, just, you know, I'm like all like, you know, prickly, you know. And, and she had... The, but she had the wisdom to know that it wasn't her that did that, that, it wasn't, that, that there was something that was causing me to boil over. And she's like, what's going on with you, Mikey? And so, I mean, very patiently, which was pretty cool, you know. Like, if you have somebody in your life that will do that, not just be like, just take it personal. Somebody's like, hey, all right, come on. Psh, I know this isn't about this. What's, what's it really about? Then you found a real friend, okay? So... I was, uh, I was like, I don't know. Psh, I mean, maybe it was this, Psh, maybe it was that. What, we, what I kind of found out after a long time of just calculating and reasoning what's going on inside of my soul right now, it was like 15 things had kind of just pressed in or pinched in all at one time. And, uh, you know, what's crazy is I'm starting to find some major trends. Now, anybody who has the faith or the audacity to go deep and in their soul and to their subconscious and dig into places that most people are fear to tread, it's a pretty scary thing to do. But I've committed myself to it, to emotional maturity. So I was like, okay, what's going on in me? So I was in there, well, I found, I'm finding some major trends going on here. Now, one of them goes all the way back. Now, I'm just one of the 15 things. You know, other things are other, anyway. But the one I'm going to follow tonight is one that goes back when I was a kid. And uh, it was a time whenever I felt like I had to pay people to be my friends. Now, I paid these two friends to stay, in, you know, to be my friend in the currency of first grade, which is fruit roll-ups. <laughs> and uh, in the currency of first grade, I said, please, please be my friend. I know this, this sounds really stupid. This sounds really dumb. This sounds really like, 
like m- immature and stupid. And it was, it was, it's first grade. Remember, we're first graders. But I'm like, I so badly wanted them to be my friends. I'm like, hey, I will, I will give you fruit roll-ups. Just stay here, I'll be right back. And, and, I, and I go inside, I come back, and they're just taking off down the alley laughing at me, right? And, I, and psh, not a big deal, right? Shouldn't be a big deal. See, we're taught to say, psh, no big deal, right? <laughs> Didn't hurt me. I mean, it was stupid kids, you know? But, but what it came down to was like, as a first grader, this is your first real experience or, or some of your first experiences with friends. And, 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 and to feel like you had to pay them. And even when you paid people to be with you, they leave you or they don't want to be your friend. And, uh, you know, I should have said no big deal, but, but I too had this little accuser Sitting, you know, the devil don't care how old you are. He sat there whispering in my ear, you're not good enough, you're not cool enough, and unless you are, you won't get anybody to like you. And that causes, the, this caused me to be more guarded the next time, okay? So next time I, I'm with friends, or I'm interacting with friends, um, you know, and, and the moment someone looked like they were going to run, I would cut them off first. I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about. And this goes to various levels, you know, but I'm talking first grade or second grade now. And then that caused me to be more guarded the next time. Like, hey, I got to really get my game together here. And when, whenever I'm interacting with friends, um, this time I would um, I put up this front because I know that everybody wants this. Or this is cool. Or they're watching this on TV. You know, this is kind of cool. So this is, I'm going to be the funny guy. Or I'm going to be the, the smart kid. Or I'm going to be the, the, the guy who can do this one little thing nobody else can do. And I'm going to be the best at this or that. Anybody ever felt that before? Like you had to be this or that or people were going to bolt on you. One thing that we all need is love. Every human being on earth was created to have love in some way have friendships and love and, and respect and all these kind of things. But what happened was because that first thing caused a, a mutation, so to speak, the next time caused a, a, didn't receive a good reaction because everybody could tell it wasn't real, created an even greater mutation, which caused a greater mutation. You can see how this goes. So this leads to um, you know, growing up thinking you know, people don't really like the real me, so I have to present something, maybe a, a facade or something, because how could they really like the real me? I don't even like the real me. So, so this then translates into love as a transaction, right? I don't, wanna, I don't want it to be, but it is. I have to pay people to be around me. By Now my currency is no longer fruit roll-ups. Now my currency is having enough jokes or being funny enough or, or being cool enough or interesting enough to have friends or not screwing up ever because if you ever screw up, then people leave you, you know, this kind of thing. So love is a transaction. I don't want it to be, but it is. And if I don't keep those plates spinning, and so, so you got the, all these relationships, and it's like that guy with a stick, and he's got plates, so you know, he's spinning all these plates, and, and i got to keep them all spinning, got to do everything just right, and there's just so much pressure, because there's no way anybody can live up to that, and eventually plates start dropping, and you can't keep up with it, and you get exhausted, and then you, then you isolate, and you say, you know what, I'm done with friendships altogether, and these kind of things. Which grows into, as an adult, beginning to, to be seeing the evil in the world, now I begin to see conversations and I begin to think for them. Now, this is very unfair to somebody to think for them. Oh, I know they said this, but what they really mean is this. Anybody ever do that? Someone say, ouch, hallelujah, if that's you. I'm so smart, I'm so wise, I know that when they say this, this is what they really mean. And I can see, and my life is about reading in between the lines and knowing what's really happening because there's always some, some you know, covert thing against me or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? What they really mean is this. And it, if you're not cool, people will leave you. For girls, it might be, if you're not beautiful enough, no one will want you. Every relationship becomes a business transaction, and people become products. So, Carrie, asking people to go out of their way for me is not cool. Asking people for help means I lose collateral in the bank of friendship, which led me to not wanting to ask a group of guys to go out of their way to help me get a refrigerator because now I'm in debt and I owe and I never want to owe anybody anything. I don't want to need anyone ever again. 
Because it takes me back to my front yard in first grade, needing friendship and the humiliation whenever that goes away and they laughed at you and all that kind of thing and then go through friendships all the way back up. And then I know that if I ask too much, that scale's gonna tip. And when it tips, they're gone. And it's this crazy fear of being alone. Just being vulnerable with you tonight. All over a refrigerator? Now, those weren't conscious thoughts. I want you to understand this. This wasn't conscious thoughts. They were reaction that boiled over. Someone say boiled over. I didn't even know why I was getting snippy at Carrie. I had no idea until I looked introspectively. Now, there's 14 other reasons, but that was one that just kind of has been this through line lately that I've been going back to and seeing these reactions where I've made such thick walls that it's so hard to get to know people, and I've been telling my accountability group, which is Roman and Rick, guys, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put up these walls. I just, I have no way of getting around them. Just please see through the wall, see me. I, I, I'm doing what I can to put them down. Because after so many wounds, a person builds up scar tissue, right? And so, these weren't, these weren't conscious thoughts. They were reactions that boiled over, and I didn't even know that they were there until I sat down. Someone say, sat down, to look inside and understand why. Now, see, as a human, we are like icebergs. Right There's uh, 10% of you that is the conscious mind that sticks out above. The things that you think about, the things that you are aware of, the things that you know, you heard this in school a hundred times. And then there's the 90% of you that's beneath the sub- surface called the subconscious, which is like this, in, this, this endless library of thoughts, memories, ideas, things that you forgot about, things that are all over the place. Go ahead and put up the next slide. It is the behaviors are up on the top the visible things that are above the water, the things that are not visible are the perceptions, your attitudes, values, and beliefs, things that, that, that um, are beneath the surface, and they all culminate in your behavior above the surface. So somebody's like, that person's just mean. Well, they don't understand what's going on beneath the surface that caused this person to be that way. Go ahead and put it back on that last slide. And so... So there are the, the unconscious, uh, the subconscious are these unconscious reasons why you do certain things. Unconscious reasons why you don't like certain kinds of people or certain kinds of foods even. Unconscious reasons why you react in certain ways and you don't even know why. Have you ever done something and you didn't even know why you did it? It's like, I have no idea why you did that. Well, if you take the time to sit down, someone say sit down, and dig around in gory introspection in the subconscious layers beneath, you may find it. But until you boil over, you don't realize how much of your life has been untouched by the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, the lordship means, you know, you, okay, so I've given my heart to God. Jesus, I give you my life, and everything I can think about right now, I'm, I'm given to you, and that's everything above the surface. And, and, and so you're saved, and that's good. Don't be afraid that you're not. But then these things start popping up from beneath the surface, and you're like, wait a minute, I thought I gave my heart to Jesus. How come this is coming up? How come this outburst is happening? How come I'm lusting? How come there's this and this and greed and jealousy and outbursts of wrath? What is happening to me? Maybe I'm not even saved. Anybody ever thought that? And it's because there is so much depth in the subconscious of your being that every day is popping up that you are submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Here's the thing, that until it pops up, you don't know that you haven't submitted it yet. So it's a good thing when you boil over sometimes because you say, oh man, that was not a good reaction. I need to go back and figure out where that came from. And you dig down and you steal that away from the devil. And you give it up to Jesus. Amen? Amen? And we usually don't figure this out until we run into immense pain. Someone say immense pain. Until the fire is turned up hot enough to make you boil over. And this pressure, this pain, and somebody, believe me, is a gift. Because every time something comes up, you're able to submit that to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. More and more become like Jesus. What if Moses would have never been pinched? What if he had never been to the point of boiling over? What if he never got to that place where he was so enraged that he snapped and then realized there was something wrong? He would have stayed in Egypt the rest of his life. See, there's a boiling point for everything. See, for water, it's 212 degrees Fahrenheit. 
even a solid like silver has a boiling point of 3,924 degrees Fahrenheit. Iron's boiling point, not just melting point, but boiling point is 5,184 degrees. And sometimes it only takes 212 degrees to make you boil over. 212 degrees is all it takes for some things that are just right there at the surface, close to the, sub, or it's close to the conscious mind. But sometimes, sometimes you get pinched with 5,184 degrees down at the very depth of your soul, and it begins to boil over. And it's so much that you have an identity crisis in a, a moment where you about split in half from deep within the iceberg of your subconscious. Let's go on to verse 15. Then... When Pharaoh heard this matter, that he had killed an Egyptian, he sought to kill Moses. So his own grandpa, who raised him, but maybe more like a pet than a son or grandson, is now going to try to kill him like he killed all, the pe- all of his people that were his same color. But Moses fled from the face of, of Pharaoh. He ran. And what do we do when we sin? We run. We hide. We we. we We try to get away. But when he couldn't run any longer, he dwelt in the land of Midian. And what did he do there? He sat down. Somebody needs to sit down tonight. Amen. Somebody needs to sit down by the well. Now, the well is symbolic of of life in the middle of a desert. It is the life. You can't live without water. And a well means if you found a well, you have life. You can survive. You can make it happen. He sits down by the well of life. Sometimes we just got to sit down. Amen? And quit trying and start looking deep introspectively and see what's going on in the places that we have not handed over to the lordship of Jesus Christ. A guy named Pete Scazzaro, the pastor in New York City who wrote the book Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, was talking about how he was driven, even as a grown man like my age or older, driven by achievement addiction. If you're taking notes, write these down because these might hit you square in the nose. Achievement addiction. He was driven by image management trying to make sure that he had this great facade up and everything. But nobody's perfect, guys. And I hope you don't come here because I am, because you will be sorely disappointed. (laughs) And people-pleasing, achievement addiction, image management, and people-pleasing. Now, how could God use someone like that? Well, how could God use someone like Moses? How could he use someone like me? How could he use someone like you? And he didn't have room in his, in his life for family because he had to keep these people, you know, or they would leave his church and he wanted to save the world. And, 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 and so his wife finally leaves his church because she's like, I can't follow you as a pastor. You're so out of balance, I can't even follow you. And this is what he said. He said, most Christians do not think they have the permission to consider their feelings or to name them or to express them openly. This is seen as weakness, by the way. This applies especially when we reflect on the more difficult feelings of fear. Oh, we can, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of nothing. Sadness. Get over it, Mikey. Or anger. Dude, what's wrong with you, man? You need to sh- chill out. It was anger and depression, however, that finally got me to stop. Someone say stop. And admit that something was desperately wrong. I could no longer stuff them. I began leaking all over my relationships. I began boiling over on all my relationships at work and at home. And I ask you tonight, children of God, what is leaking all over your relationships tonight? What reactions have been boiling over and sloshing onto others? Like you're carrying this molten or this cup of molten iron and every time you get bumped, it sloshes over onto somebody else. What does that do to them? Ooh, you get a little molten on you. Woo, you're going to molten all over somebody else. You know what I'm saying? Hurt people hurt people. See, we as Christians have this desire to be good Christians, don't we? But we keep boiling over, like I said, with the, with the iceberg. We keep boiling over. So, so my goal is, okay, well, well, just more Bible study. If I know more about the Bible, you know, I'll be a good Christian. But then something happens. My brother's they're the you know family is the one that will set you off the most. Boom, and I boil over. Crap! Well, I thought it was Bible study. Maybe I just need to be in community more, you know, and, and more community. And blah blah blah. But then we bump into each other, and then slosh all over each other, and then psh, boil over. Crap! It's not it's not community. What about the power of the Spirit? Prayer. John Wesley said nothing happens except through prayer. God change me. God change me. God change me. And he's like. He's like, okay, we, you're not letting me go down into your subconscious. And it's, God, just, just do it for me. Just do it for me. Do all the work. Just do it. 
and, uh, and then bump into somebody and phew, start boiling over. And, oh, it's spiritual warfare. Oh, it's like the demons, the angels, the demons are making me do things and blah, 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 blah. And uh, there is a spiritual battle. And we need to be, understand that we can bind things on earth and bind things in heaven and all that kind of stuff is very true. But that doesn't have anything to do with your boiling point. Well, maybe it's worship. I just need to spend more time worshiping God. And then, you know, and, and he'll transform me that way. But yet there's still things under the surface that haven't been dealt with. So you boil over. Well, maybe it's service. Maybe Matthew 25 says that we need to go and help the poor. So we'll just go serve, 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 serve. And I have a friend right now, an older lady. They're at retirement age. And, and, uh, and uh, she would serve, 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 serve. And then, boom, divorce. What? And boiling over. This, this, how is this happening? These are all good things, but we keep boiling over. See, guys, we super spiritualize some very basic things. Very basic things that need to be dealt with. You're made up of three things, a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, you're, now, when you gave your heart to Jesus, your spirit was transformed. Old things became new. You're a new creation, a new creature. God recreated your spirit. Boom. And your body, this is the place where you dwell, right? And whenever this gets destroyed, you're done. But that's where you dwell. And your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, are untouched because these are conscious things that we have to give up to the Lord, right? Our will, we have to submit our will to him. He's not going to be, he's, not gonna, he's a gentleman, he's not going to force you. He's a gentleman, he's gonna, and so we have to give him our will and our mind and our emotions too. So your life after the salvation experience is a constant transforming or reforming or reshaping like, like, like an artist who's creating this sculpture and he's forming you as long as you will allow him with your will to do so. This is a fancy word that's, that theologians call sanctification. So if you have notes, I would write that down, sanctification. This is a constant shaping of, into the image of Christ. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Be transformed. How? By the renewing of your what? Your mind. So that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. 2 Corinthians uh, 3.18 says, But we all with unveiled faces behold in this mirror the glory of God. So we're looking at God and when we're together in worship services or together and whatever. And we are being transformed. How are we being transformed? Into the same image of God. How? From glory to glory. That's how we're being transformed, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, so, so renewing of your mind. When God gets inside your mind, what is that? The subconscious and, and the conscious. When you bring the subconscious up to the conscious level and with your will, you make it obedient to Christ. This is how God begins to sanctify you. This is how God begins to transform you. This is how he begins to renew your mind. Amen? And we're transformed from glory to glory. It doesn't happen all at once, does it? It happens every Tuesday, 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 Sunday, 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 Sunday. Quiet time to quiet time to quiet time. Amen? As you sit there, as you what? Sit down. Stop running. You sit down and you bring up, say, God, what do you want to talk about today? And he brings something up from beneath the surface. You're like, God, why are you always bringing up all this stuff? You know? Why? Do you, he's like, because Mikey, I want to be the Lord of your life. And that means I need to be the Lord of everything. And so over time, I'm going to keep bringing these things up. And if, and if you don't bring them up in your quiet time, then I'm going to let you get into a boiling point so that it comes out and you have to see it. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty and of God for the pulling down of strongholds. Did you know that your mind, uh, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, actually we've got a picture of her right here. She's done a study of the brain for over 30 some years. She wrote a book, uh, Who Switched My Brain Off? And she has this whole thing, Switch On Your Brain, uh, all about memorization and stuff. And they've taken brains and they've cut them, you know, in, into little bitty pieces, put them under electromagnoscopes, electron magnoscopes or whatever, microscopes, sorry. And, um, and, and, they say, and she said, it's amazing what you find when you look under the microscope. You can tell where a thought that was really established is. It looks like a, like a bush, like, like there's like a tree there. And, and it's a very established thought. He, she said, it's very funny too. You can tell which memories were not that which ones were painful because it looks like a thorn bush. And it actually those thorns on, the, on those dendrites make it hard for the, for the electro, uh, electrical pulses to go across. 
So it's like they get, the, the brain is actually painful whenever the electric, like, you know, as they mem- remember those things. They're these deeply embedded memories. She said, and that can control your brain. It cont- controls the way. There are, you know, our brain is called a neuroplastic brain. It, it, there are, it, it's constantly being formed and reshaped. And the cool thing is, and she talks about this, and many other scientists have talked about this, that in the process of over 30 days and three sets of 30 days, you can completely rewire your brain by renewing your mind, thinking the, the thoughts of Christ. What does it say in 2 Corinthians 10.4? That these, there are strongholds or strong bush-looking tree things in your brain made up of, of these bunches of dendrites. Strongholds, either for good or for evil. But we can pull down those strongholds. Casting down what? Arguments. Arguments come from what? Thoughts. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Any thought that says God is not God. Or no God. I'm, I'm in control here. Verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that assaults itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every what? Thought into the captivity and the obedience of Christ. What she said is like, let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to the, um, the iceberg for a second. What she's saying is like, the, what's beneath the surface is like this huge library. So you, the, the conscious mind, uh, you know, the one that's aware You go into this library and pull out these long drawers, you know, and you take out each thought, you know what I mean, like a book or a file, and you open it up and you say, is this the way God sees the world? Is this the way God sees me? Is this the way God sees this situation? Is this the way God sees my reactions? Is this the way God believes my beliefs, my, be, I mean, my beliefs, my thoughts, my, my, my theology, all these things, you take it out, and, and if, if something is out of whack with God's ways, you bring it, what? It says 2 Corinthians 10.5, bring every thought into captivity, into the obedience of Christ. Says, no, that's not what she really meant when she said that. What she meant, she didn't mean that when she said that. What she was going through, this or that, boom, obedience of Christ. No, I'm not going to gossip about this anymore. That's not what God wants me to do. Boom. Oh, no. You know what? I know that we were just kids. I'm not letting them off the hook. That did hurt. But I know blah, 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 blah about this person. And maybe, God, you can sanctify this. Boom. And then, you know what I'm saying? And then so through a lifetime, you go through these files in your subconscious. And before long, from glory to glory, you're transformed into the very image of Christ. But first to do that, you have to sit down. Worship team, would you come? Digging into the iceberg of your subconscious and finding the things that are not bowing down to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Bowing down every part of you. Because when you gave your heart to the Lord, you gave everything you knew to give him, right? But as time goes by, you start to find there's other things that I have not quite given him yet. And as he brings those things up, or as situations cause you to boil over, you have a choice to either suppress that, conceal, don't feel, pretend like you didn't see it, or to deal with it. The only way to deal with it is through morbid introspection. Is your life reactionary? To what other people think, to what other people did, or to what other people might do. Are you trying hard tonight to be a committed Christian? You've tried, man, more Bible study, more this, more that, more that, but you keep boiling over and you can't seem to stop and you don't know why and you just feel like you're just a mess up and maybe you're not even saved in the first place. Not true. You just have these same reactions that every time someone pulls that trigger or trips that wire, you explode or things happen or you, you react in the same way. It's like a cat when you have a little laser and you just, every time, <laughs> I mean, every time, I just put the laser and my cat goes crazy. I'm like, oh, this never gets old because every time I push the button, the cat goes crazy. You know what I'm saying? Just keep doing it. And that's the devil. He's just got this little, this little beam. He's like, oh, man, he's never going to see this. Woo and you just keep going to it. You know what I'm saying? You're running all over. You're swiping at it. You can never hit it. Why? Until you realize what's going on, you'll never be able to change. You can pray all you want. But until you dig down and you realize, oh, wait, there's a devil over there. He's holding that, he's holding that laser. 
or there is a memory that I haven't dealt with, or there is some pain that I am still very tender to the touch on, that I have not released up to God, and I have not forgiven people for, then you will continue to be that cat running around like a fool. You want to be a committed Christian, but you're stuck. Or maybe you're too busy running, 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 running to Midian. Eventually, you've got to sit down at the well. Amen? Maybe you're consumed with cons- con- constant busyness to keep you from looking beneath the surface. Too busy to dig down into your subconscious. Too busy to sit down at the well. Tonight, I think if, you've, if you see these things in yourself, just like Moses did, he realized, I have to sit down. I need to maybe take a step back. Maybe I need to look and see what the action that caused this reaction, where it came from. Like a good friend that Carrie was to me, I want to be to you tonight. And see, where is this coming from, really? That's not you. That's not you. That's not the real you. That's the reactionary you. Tonight, is there a place in your life that maybe you have not submitted? You know, some of you might know it's like right close to the surface. Some, there's that boiling point of 5,000 degrees. Well, why not just dig down and give it to God rather than having to run into killing somebody, you know? Close your eyes and stand with me tonight.